Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So hello and welcome to this NPTO course entitled 20th Century Fiction, where we'll begin with a new text today, which is Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. We've just finished Rabindranath Tagore's short story, The Postmaster. And in this particular lecture, I'll give you um, an overview of this particular text, uh, Heart of Darkness, before diving into the text per se. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the cultural background of this text, how this text emerges and what it is reflective of, uh, culturally and politically speaking before moving into the nitty-gritty of what the text contains. So this was written in 1899, Heart of Darkness, uh, so just one year before 20th century, and yet it is considered to be one of the first uh, modernist novels, uh, so to say. Um, there are a number of issues we'll deal with while we're looking at this text, I and mean, it's a very complex text, and it does offer lots and lots of readings, and it's very relevant. It continues to be relevant uh, at different times, in different uh, cultural and political settings. but. First and foremost, what we need to understand is this particular novel, Heart of Darkness, is a big departure, it's a dramatic departure from the Victorian novels of uh, classic realism. Uh, so this is a novel about, uh, you know, a man's journey in Congo, a white man's journey in Congo, uh, you know, his experience of having worked in a Belgian company in Congo. And the entire story, the entire novel is about that man coming back to London, to Britain, and then telling a story of what happened to him in Congo, what happened to him uh, in that experience. The colonial experience. So essentially, it's a journey novel. It's a, it's a journey of a man, you know, to, to a particular place, and then coming back and telling a story about that place. But more than a, a geographical journey, it's about a psychological journey. It's about the mental journey, uh, the emotional journey of that one person. And it is one of the first novels, one of the early novels, essentially, which deals with very complex themes such as colonial guilt, uh, colonial ambivalence. Uh, although it's still very much uh, you know, embedded in the entire um, uh, racialized discourse. I mean, it's not really a novel about, uh, which completely criticizes colonialism. It's not a novel which breaks away from the racism of colonialism. It doesn't do all that. In fact, a lot of scholarship on Heart of Darkness, which deals directly on how racist uh, the novel is. Uh, but then that's racist if you compare that novel, if you read the novel with our present lenses, our critical lenses today. But the time in which is written, 1899, it was a, a, a very strange kind of novel uh, because it doesn't glorify colonialism at all. It doesn't glamorize colonialism at all. Instead, it gives a very dark, decadent picture of colonialism. It gives you essentially a glimpse of the very dark, decadent underbelly of colonialism, where it's not really a noble mission, it's not a Christianizing mission, it's not nothing to do with any civilization or process. It's essentially about naked exploitation. And the nakedness of exploitation is something which Heart of Darkness describes in very graphic details. Uh, so uh, it's about a white man uh, and his experience, his knowledge that the colonialism or imperialism as it exists in Congo, a Belgian imperialism in the context of this novel, is essentially a naked exploitative enterprise, right? It's not nothing to do with civilization at all. So that's what a uh, novel uh, deals with uh, quite complexly. Uh, and among other things, this is also a novel about survivor's guilt, right? So it's a term that I'll come back to uh, frequently throughout this course. Survivor's guilt is, is a very common uh, form of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It happens a lot with soldiers and veterans who come back from wars, uh, who feel the guilt of having survived a war, which have taken away lives of their friends, their fellow soldiers. So uh, Marlow, uh, and who's the protagonist in this particular story, Heart of Darkness, and who's a storyteller as well, who's the one, uh, he's telling the story inside the narrative. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a very complex narrative structure. So the novel starts with third person narrative. There is a narrator uh, who is also a character in the novel. And then the narrator tells us a story about Marlowe's story, who then becomes the narrator in the story. So it's like a Chinese box of narration, right? So first of all, there's unnamed narrator. Uh, who is telling the story about Marlowe's story and then Marlowe takes over. Uh, he's telling the story inside the story. So there are three different levels of narration at play. So Marlowe is a man who signs up to work for a Belgian company in Congo. He goes to Brussels and, you know, it's a very interesting juxtaposition of uh, a white city with a non-white space. And a white city is essentially described as a dead city. There's something very sepulchral about Brussels uh, that Marlowe says, something very coffin-like. 
uh, something very dead. And the whiteness of Brussels uh, is very, very interesting because that is contrasted with the whiteness that the ivory uh, presents, the ivory, the elephant trunk, which is a massive trade uh, from the, the African uh, setting over here. The Congo setting is one that supplies ivory uh, to Belgian companies, which is shipped conveniently uh, back to Brussels and you know, it becomes a big mercantile signifier which is consumed uh, in, a, in a very mercantile fashion it becomes a commodity so in among other things heart of darkness is also a story about naked commodification about how everything becomes a commodity uh, crude commodification and the difference between the belgian imperialism and the british imperialism was the belgian imperialism didn't make any effort to dress up as some kind of a lofty mission it didn't make any effort to dress up as a noble narrative at all it was always a very naked exploitative enterprise and that was something which is uh, sort of staring at the face all the time among everyone. So, uh, you know, that, that quality of imperialism is something which is very present in Heart of Darkness uh, and Marlowe represents it. Marlowe embodies the nakedness of the imperialism, of that exploitation and the guilt which comes out of the knowledge that you have been part of the exploitative machinery, that you have been part of the um, exploitative process. It's very, very much uh, complicit to it. Uh, whether you like it or not. And that guilt, that knowledge of being complicit, that ambivalence about colonialism, that nervousness about colonialism, about survivor's guilt, it also affects the storytelling process uh, to a large extent. So Malu emerges as a very, very unreliable storyteller. So in that sense, he's one of the first unreliable narrators in fiction, in English fiction. Uh, which becomes a very big thing in postmodern fiction, as some of you would know. The last part of postmodernism is about unreliability, unreliability of memory, unreliability of storytelling, unreliability of narrativizing, etc. So Mahler becomes one of the early uh, unreliable narrators. And we are told at uh, different times in the story that uh, you know, he puts his uh, listeners to sleep. And at one point, the omniscient narrator, the, the narrator outside the frame, the one who's telling us the story, uh, he's the only one who's awake. All the other people go to sleep in a little boat. Uh, so entire setting is on a boat in Thames. Uh, and again, the river Thames and the river Congo are very interesting and juxtaposed with each other, just like Brussels and Congo. Uh, the white space and a non-white space. So while Thames becomes a metaphor of civilization, of trade, of commerce, of industry, of imperial industrial growth, uh, Congo becomes a site from where the growth uh, you know, gets its wealth from. So it's a very, very uneven kind of a juxtaposition, a very, very uneven kind of traffic at play over here. So Congo becomes a naked river, uh, the African river, uh, the other river, so to say, uh, compared to Thames. And the whole idea of otherness is very, very important over here. The whole idea of otherness, the so alterity, uh, which is the production of otherness, is very important over here. And, and a lot of critics have criticized, uh, um, you know, Conrad and How to Darkness, very rightly, by saying that the entire novel is sort of prismed, as it were, to the white man's lens. Uh, no African ever speaks in How to Darkness. Uh, there's no dialogue, there's no line given to any non-white person, which obviously means that entire ambivalence, guilt, uh, you know, it all becomes the white man's guilt, the white man's exile, the white man's uh, nervous condition, etc. Uh, and, you know, all it does is that it is projected onto the non-white people, the non-white spaces, uh, which is obviously a very reductionist way of looking at the non-white setting, the, the Congo setting in this case which is a very, very valid argument, which is a very, very uh, right argument, because I don't know how the darkness does come up with that kind of a thing. It's entirely about the white man's mind. Uh, it's about the white man's ambivalence, the white man's nervousness, the white man's uh, decadence, so to say. But what's also interesting is to see how uh, whiteness as a civilizational construct, whiteness as a cultural construct, whiteness as a racial construct, is so uh, deliciously deconstructed in Heart of Darkness because we have the character of Kurtz, uh, Colonel Kurtz in Heart of Darkness, who is essentially uh, the protagonist. I mean, he's really the protagonist in Heart of Darkness because the entire novel is about uh, the mission to find Kurtz, uh, to bring him back uh, to the white space. So what do you know about Kurtz? So Kurtz essentially is a white man, the ideal white man, the ideal white soldier uh, who was created by imperialism. He is supposed to be the best uh, embodiment of the machinery of imperialism. Uh, so he's a perfect embodiment, perfect extension, uh, the perfect extended embodiment of imperialism. So he's a perfect soldier who is sent to Africa. And then something very interesting happens to him. He turns native. Uh, and this whole idea of turning native is a very, very sort of colonial discursive study 
that we do in postcolonial studies quite often. But the whole point is, when Kurtz turns native, what he does is he completely betrays the system which creates him, which had created him historically, right? So he turns his back to the system, and he becomes the uh, autocrat in that particular island, in that particular setting, in partic that particular setting of Congo. So he essentially becomes the dictator of that particular island, right? And he stops being a an officer of colonial machinery, he starts being an officer in the Belgian imperial machinery uh, and he takes over as the sole white person, the sole individual lord, the god of that particular place, uh, so to say. So, this whole idea of turning native, the whole idea of the white man who was created by in the, in the entire imperialist machinery and sent off to control the empire, but what if that white man cracks up? What if that white man turn, na turns native? What if that white man uh, becomes a renegade uh, to a certain extent? So, how the darkness deals with that as well to a large extent and this whole encounter with Kurtz becomes a very symbolic, existential and political encounter and we find that uh, and that's uh, this is why what I meant at the beginning when I said that this is a novel which is very relevant and topical to us today, because you know even if we look at some of the uh, geopolitical uh, crisis in the moment in the world, the whole idea of setting up an empire, the whole idea of setting up a civilizing mission somewhere, and sending someone, whether it's a dictator, whether it's uh, you know a puppet government, whether it's uh, some kind of a democratic setting, uh, you know which is controlled essentially by a white government from outside. Uh, controlled by a white uh, power center from the outside. Now, what happens to that setting, that dictator, if that puppet government, if that democratic setting uh, turns renegade and turns its back to the uh, white power controlling it, supposedly controlling it from the outside? Then it becomes a problem, then it becomes a crisis, it becomes a betrayal of sorts. So, how the darkness you know, deals with these issues as well and in, in many senses is very relevant to some of the geopolitical tensions that we have in the world today, uh, you know, the world we inhabit today. It does have very similar tensions in terms of uh, certain kinds of power centers being set up uh, by eccentric powers, uh, powers that you know, exist outside uh, that particular space, but once you control it completely. Uh, and so, coming over directly, uh, the new forms of imperialism, they descend, they set up some little systems of governance, which are obviously puppet systems which are completely controlled but for eccentrically from the outside. Now, oftentimes we find that, you know, those little settings that turn renegade, they turn the back, they, they betray and they, they become subversive, uh, the challenge uh, and delegitimize authority of the white imperial center at the outside, which is something which happens in the heart of darkness as well. But, uh, so the entire complexity of Heart of Darkness, which is a very political, you know, emotional, existential, racial complexity, uh, is uh, Marlow attempts to put that into a story, uh, uh, you know, the, the insert character Marlow, the narrator in Heart of Darkness, he, you know, the insert narrator, he turns to, he tries to turn this into a story, but it fails each time. And the failure of Marlow is very, very symbolic, uh, because in many sense, if we're looking at it from a, uh, the history of the novel, uh, so to say, uh, this is also the failure of classic realism. Because classic realism as a white bourgeois, a mercantile construct, uh, which essentially grew with imperialism. If you look at the history of the novel a little bit, uh, I'm digressing a bit, but this is relevant. If you look at the history of the novel, uh, the novel as a genre, it grew along with imperialism. So it came into being, so to say, with the rise of a mercantile class, who essentially became the imperialist subsequently and very, very quickly. Uh, so classic realism as a narrative trope, as a narrative strategy, as a narrative machinery, it was very much complicit with imperialism. Now, if we look at how the darkness politically as a novel, which is about the breaking up of imperialism, is about the cracking up of imperialism, so to say, uh, it's also in a very interesting sense a cracking up of classic realism because, you know, the classic realism doesn't quite work in How the Darkness anymore and Marlowe struggles to put that story into a classic realist frame and that uh, departure from classic realism, uh, that ambivalence about classic realism as a stylistic category, as a stylistic instrument of narration is very, very important because uh, that is very, very parallel, uh, politically speaking, uh, with the crisis of imperialism, so to say. So, we have a narrative style and we have a political style at, you know, dialogue with each other. Uh, very, very interesting, which has so historically been the case. Uh, so, imperialism as a political instrument and classic realism as a narrative instrument were, you know, very, very synergic with each other uh, in the history of British Empire. Uh, so to say.
So with the crisis emanating from imperialism, uh, the complexity, the guilt, the nervousness, the decadence, the knowledge of decadence, uh, the imminent decadence that is coming out. And if you compare that uh, into the narrative strategy of classical realism not working anymore, uh, it becomes a very interesting study. And very often in the novel, Heart of Darkness, Marlowe acknowledges his failure uh, as a classic realist narr narrator. He, he, he knows that this machinery of narration doesn't work anymore. And there are moments in the story where he gives a very exasperated sentence by saying, oh, you're falling asleep. I must be boring you to death. Uh, I must be a very nervous narrator. And the nervousness of Marlowe as a narrator is sort of dialoguing with his nervousness as an imperial agent uh, in, inside Congo as well. So we have all these very different complex, uh, complex narrative strategies at play in Heart of Darkness, which, as I mentioned, are very dialoguing with the political crisis in Heart of Darkness. So yes, it is a very racist novel. It's a very reductionist novel. It's entirely told from a white man's perspective. But given the time in which it's written, it still exists as a very, very interesting novel, so to say. And like you said, um, despite its political incorrectness, or maybe because of its political incorrectness, it becomes a very relevant novel for us today, a very topical novel for us today. Because, you know, we find so many resonances uh, about Heart of Darkness in terms of what's happening geopolitically across the world, the Middle East, uh, other parts of Africa, uh, some parts of Europe, uh, even closer to home in India. So you have different kinds of crises and tensions, uh, political tensions, which are quite dialoguing with what happens and how to darkness historically. So that becomes a very, very interesting uh, kind of study, which we'll move on uh, in due course of time. Now, the different readings of how to darkness that we can do, uh, one obviously is a colonial reading, which is very much foregrounded in how to darkness. It's about colonialism, it's about imperialism, it's about uh, the entire Belgian empire in Congo. Uh, it's also about uh, the, the question of gender. The, the gender question is very important in how to darkness. And we find, uh, unsurprisingly, that entire machinery of colonialism is an all male machinery. It's all the men who go out there to control the colonies. And we have some very interesting woman figures, uh, female figures in how to darkness. So we have uh, the very stony woman in the Brussels office uh, who sit and who uh, uh, look at Marlowe very, very stonily and they, they essentially embody the sepulchral quality of Brussels, the dead quality of Brussels, the emotionless quality of Brussels uh, as a sort of very, very still, uh, you know, uh, emotionless uh, you know, imperial enterprise. And then we have, very interestingly, uh, another female character in How to Darkness who appears at the end of the novel. Uh, there are actually two characters, and I'm going to talk about them in some details as we move on. So, when it comes to when, when it comes to Colonel Kutz, we find that he had a fiance in uh, in, in Brussels, someone who was intended to marry. He's called Kutz's intended, uh, a white woman, of course, uh, who he had left behind and gone to Congo uh, with the promise of coming back and marrying her. Uh, but of course, they never married. Uh, and then we have uh, the other woman uh, that Kurtz, uh, you know, lived with in Congo, the, the African mistress. And of course, the African mistress uh, is described in very corporeal details. So the uh, hyper-embodied quality of the African mistress is contrasted with the almost bodiless quality uh, of the European uh, intended. And if you look at the words, which are very, very interesting, uh, fiancé or intended uh, are markers of prestige, markers of respectability, whereas mistress uh, is uh, essentially a marker of sexuality, uh, beastly sexuality maybe, uh, and it's not respectable at all. So again, the terms uh, are quite revelatory, so to say. One is very wide, civilizational, respectable, and the other is non-wide, of course, non-civilizational and you know, not respectable at all. Now, and then we take a look at the uh, more complex situation in terms of the gender politics and how to darkness. So you find that uh, Kutz is intended, uh, is, is mourning at the end of the novel. She appears as a very elegant mourner. Uh, someone is mourning the death of Kurtz, uh, whereas the African mistress uh, doesn't say anything, doesn't have any voice, doesn't g is not given any line at all, unsurprisingly. And she just wails out a cry of despair when Kurtz dies in the novel. And the wailing, is again uh, something uh, of a beastly performance, it's something very beastly and corporeal about the mistress. It's all body, uh, a very hypersexualized body. And the wailing, the scream, is an embodiment of the hypersexuality that the African other woman represents or embodies uh, with her situatedness. Whereas the very elegant, uh, you know, non verbal, I mean, almost non verbal and definitely non embodied mourning of Kutz's intended, the white woman, uh, is a marker of prestige, respectability, sophistication, uh, you know, very, very bourgeois markers of uh, agency, markers of respectability and privilege, so to say. But interestingly, we find 
that both women, despite their oppositional status, one being civilizational, quote unquote, one being uncivilizational, quote unquote, they both have absolutely no access to agency. And this denial of access to agency is very important uh, in, in Heart of Darkness because what it shows us is that the entire male machinery of uh, imperialism uh, it was essentially a very, very gendered thing. It's only the male who had access to power, privilege, agency, etc., etc. Whereas the women, uh, complete, you know, unable to have any access to agency, they were either lied to, as in the case of uh, Kurtz's uh, intended, we'll come to that in a moment, or uh, they were just used as a messy, corporeal, hypersexualized body. Uh, and that's about it. They didn't really have any political agency or social agency or cultural agency in terms of gaining privilege from out of darkness. So they were just there as reflected persons, uh, persons who lived in reflected glory, or reflected privilege, uh, which were brought in by the men or the males in out of darkness. So we'll, we'll talk about that in more details as we move on and how the entire location of female in Heart of Darkness is very, very important and very symbolic in quality as well because it does reflect the entire male machinery, the homosocial male hypermasculinist machinery of imperialism which is represented and embodied by the novel Heart of Darkness, so to say. So this being the cultural setting, this being the political setting in Heart of Darkness, we find that this is an extremely complex novel in terms of what it does, in terms of what it reflects, in terms of what it represents. Uh, there are so many different readings we can emerge, we can get out of this novel and I as a faculty in English, a teacher in English, a researcher in English, a student in English, I never fail to be amazed uh, by the novel in terms of how topical it is, how resonant it is uh, in terms of what's happening geopolitically today. And although it's written in 1899, although it has many problematic, uh, you know, representations, uh, it's very politically incorrect, it's racist in many levels, uh, you know, but despite the, oh, like I said, because of its political incorrectness, it does appear to be a very honest novel uh, about a very honest human condition, uh, you know, a condition of crisis, a condition of unpredictability, a condition of precarity, right? So it's a very, it's a novel about fragility, uh, of, you know, it's a novel about decadence, it's a novel about darkness. And you find that, uh, by the time we finish reading the novel, it's a very thin novel by the way, it's more of a novella than a novel but it's a notoriously long novel despite its brevity, it will take an enormous amount of time to read it because of something that Conrad does you know, very, very consistently and I'll come to that term later. Uh, it's just a term called defamiliarization or Australian, but I'll spend a lot of time on it as we move on in the next lectures. But you know, suffice it to say that it, despite its brevity, it's probably 90 pages, it will take a lot of time to read it because of the way language is used in How to Darkness, the way narration is uh, you know, uh, structured and designed in How to Darkness. So that becomes a very important character, so to say. Uh, so, you know, we deal with all this in, in the times to come, but you know, this is a novel, like I said, it never fails to be resonant and topical and, and relevant in the world we live in today. It's about imperial guilt, it's about political incorrectness, it's about racism, it's about the knowledge of racism, it's about the knowledge of the hollowness of any attempt uh, to justify human exploitation any attempt to justify human torture, any attempt to justify human inequality, uh, the knowledge that you know, all these attempts are hollow at the core uh, is a knowledge of horror and heart of darkness. There's a very famous line, uh, Kurtz's dying words in heart of darkness which is the horror, the horror. And there have been many interpretations of that, uh, but we find by the end of the novel that the heart of darkness is not really in Africa. The heart of darkness is actually in Europe. The heart of darkness is actually in the white space because the entire civilization of the white people, you know, as is represented in the novel, the beautiful, uh, posh, pristine white city or Brussels is essentially uh, being fed uh, by the exploitation that comes from Congo the different markers of exploitation, the different markers of torture, the different markers of inequality that come from Congo and that knowledge you know, makes the entire European civilization, the entire European culture a heart of darkness. So the heart of darkness is actually European over here. If you read the novel carefully, that's what the novel is trying to tell you. That it's not really out there in Africa, the heart of darkness, that's not really the, the, the dark space. The dark space is actually inside Europe uh, and the acknowledgement of that is the producer of guilt. So the entire novel is about the production of guilt the production of nervousness, the production of uh, admission of nervousness and guilt and the inability to convey that into a narrative, right? So the inability to convey the nervousness, the knowledge of uh, guilt into a narrative, uh, in the classic realist narrative. So it doesn't fit into the classic realist narrative at all. And therein lies the complexity 
even as readers, we find it such a complex novel. Uh, it, it's not a novel that we can consume very quickly. It's a novel which we have to reinterpret even as a reading it because it's a very complex novel which works on different layers of cognitive complexity. Uh, it's a knowledge about guilt, it's a knowledge about trauma and the inability, like I said, uh, to convey all that into a classic realist frame, which is what takes place in Heart of Darkness. So with that, we conclude the lecture today. I hope you get a brief and sufficient overview of the novel uh, in terms of its cultural and political setting. And the next lecture as we move on the text, we'll be deal with some sections carefully and consistently and find out how it's dialoguing with some of the broad strands we talked about in this lecture. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next lecture.